unmute. Hey, welcome to Tuesdays in the Shop. We took last week off for reasons. And this week, surprise, it's me doing the tutorial also for reasons. Um, hopefully I will be a good replacement for Andrea, even though she's more the person who normally will teach you techniques and, you know, I'm the quilting person, she's the sewing, piecing person. Um, what? Oh, sorry, she made a hand you're gesture that I was like, oh, what does that mean, you know? No, you're doing great. Um, so I hope you all had a restful long weekend, if you got a long weekend. Um, we are raring to go with another week of quilting fun for you. Um, this week, our topic is bias binding. So if you don't know what I mean by bias binding, it means bias cut binding. So this piece of binding, if you look at the seam, inside was pieced on the bias. Um, why would you want to do this? And what are the options, right? If you, you may actually think that all binding is bias, right? Because especially if you come from a garment making background where you can buy pre-made bias binding, all binding is bias, really. And that's because for garments, you're going around uh, curved things, right? So like around, actually, I think this shirt actually has some. Um, around the corner, around the uh, sleeve hole, right? If you're gonna go around a curve like this, your binding has to be, well, maybe it doesn't have to be, but it certainly makes your life easier if it's cut on the binding, on the bias, because on bias, it's stretchier. And as piecers, we know that it's kind of annoying to piece two pieces of fabric that are cut on the bias together because they're kind of stretchy, right? That is a uh, downside for piecing the top of your quilt, but it is a nice to have when you're sewing around a rounded edge, uh, whether it's a rounded corner on a quilt or for a garment like a neckline like this. Um, so if you came from a garment making background and you come to quilts, you maybe never thought about a straight cut binding before, but I'll admit that for me, I almost never make bias binding. I almost always do straight cut binding, straight cut on the grain binding because it's faster and a little bit less fussy. Um, but there are reasons that bias binding is preferable or even necessary. The first one is if you're going around a curve, like I just mentioned. The second reason is simply for aesthetics. So see this, this is like a barber pole stripe. We actually used a stripe fabric to create this effect. You can't really do that if you're cutting it on the grain, if you're buying straight, striped fabric and you want it to go on the diagonal on your quilt, you're gonna to have to cut it on the bias, right? And that's a perfectly good reason to cut it differently is because you actually want the design to go in that direction. Um, another benefit of bias binding on your quilt is that it's actually a little bit more tough wearing. So imagine a quilt that you are giving to a child who will be really beating it up. Imagine a quilt that you really hope will be passed down generation to generation we all know that the part of your quilt that breaks down the fastest, the first thing that comes apart is the binding. And that's because on the edge, it's getting a ton of wear and tear, right? Uh, bias binding, all those little threads that make up the fabric, they are going this way and this way. That means like pretend a kid takes like a uh, edge and picks at it like this, right? this little hole that's created won't keep running because the threads are going like this. If this was straight cut binding, you might end up with that whole thing just ripping down the side and then your binding is gone. So if you want a more durable quilt binding, do one the extra step of cutting it on the bias. Um, and there's one, is there one more reason that I forgot? Okay, I made a list, design, curves, garments and strengths. So I did all my lists without even having to check my list. So now I gave up, uh, gave you the secret that I wrote down a list to make sure that I did all of them. So those are all the reasons that we've come up with for why you might want to make bias binding. Um, and if you never want to make bias binding, that's allowed too. Again, I do 95% of my quilts have straight binding. And actually, to be fair, I don't even make the binding for most of my quilts. Andrea does it for me. Um, but we're gonna pretend that this is something I actually do and I'm gonna show you how, okay? So, show some samples? Yeah, we're gonna switch cameras okay. and we're gonna show you um, two examples that we made. 
So this first one is kind of like a gigantic mug rug. Um, and the reason we made this sample is this is the same binding. By the way, this is tulip pink tent stripe. Um, what's this color name called? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Lupin, yeah. If that's how you pronounce Lupine? it. Lupine? Uh, Who knows? I don't know. L-U-P-I-N-E, however <laughs> yes. you pronounce that. Um, so this bias binding strip is what was used to bind this round giant coaster. Um, this is demonstrating that going around a quilt that has curved corners, or maybe you're going around literally a coaster, it will lie nice and flat when you're sewing your binding on because it's bias cut. So that extra stretch on that edge fits nicely when you go around the edge and you don't end up with those puckers that can sometimes happen when you're trying to go around an edge and you don't have to kind of like wrestle as much. It just kind of wants to go around a curve. So that's why we made this sample. Um, this sample more closely resembles a quilt that has rounded corners. So Part of it is sewn straight and part of it is a curve. So you can see that we can sew in either, either on a straight edge or on a curved edge. And this bias stripe is made with a thinner stripe. This is one of the new Tula um, tiny stripes, which is a new basic that Tula just launched. It came out with the Tiny Beasts collection that just landed a couple of weeks ago. And we are obsessed with these we're going to be using them nonstop, and one of the key reasons we love a striped fabric is for bias binding going for that barber pole angled look so here is how it looks when you're done let's see how easy it is to make so the first thing i'm going to talk about is how to make this process a little easier to understand so we for our first sample we started with a square piece of fabric we can make bias binding from a rectangle, but it's just easier to explain and to visualize if you start with a square first. So what we did is we cut a square piece of fabric, you know, 10 inches by 10 inches or 12 inches by 12 inches, whatever it is. And that's what we started with, right? This length and this width are the same number. We took a standard 24 inch ruler that we all own, plopped it down corner to corner and slid it in half to give us two triangles that are exactly the same. All we're gonna do from this step is we're gonna rearrange the order of these two pieces. So instead of them being together at that diagonal, we're going to put one over and kind of say, you know, you were on the left, now you're gonna be on the right. Or in the case of this particular stripe, better yet would be, I'm gonna put them back how they were, and I'm going to instead go in this direction. Same process, right? My on the grain edge is touching another on the grain edge and my two bias edges are parallel to each other. Well, actually the two on the grain edges are parallel to each other too. But why did I swap? I swapped because if you look at it like this, it's really easy to make your stripes match if you move them the way that I just moved them, right? If I had moved this piece to this part, there's nothing to line up, right? And then if you wanted to try to make a neater stripe, you'd have to like try to measure and like sew exactly on the right spot. It's possible, it's just a lot more work. So save yourself the hassle and just align to the actual stripe. And then you're gonna pin and you're just going to sew these two pieces together with a quarter inch seam like we normally would. Um, and what that ends up looking like is this parallelogram. A parallelogram, it's in the name, parallel sides. That's all it means, right? So you can think of it as like a rectangle that got shifted. Um, this parallelogram, oh, and by the way, the thing I just explained <laughs> uh, about lining these up, we didn't actually do that on this sample. It's like, what I say, not what I do. oh yeah, for sure. Um, this is what is easier to do, but, and we were going to do this, and then it kind of just like flew out of my head, and then I actually sewed it like this, and then I was like, you know what, I'm gonna show it because this gives you the example of if you sew it in this orientation, this is what you get, and if you were to sew it 
lining these two up, you would get potentially a more pleasing striped match at that point, right? Um, and you can see we didn't even try to sew like the width of it together nicely or anything. But anyway, it'll still work. It's just not as perfect. Um, okay, so we have our seam that has been sewn. I'm going to flip it over so you can see it. So this is a quarter inch seam, just like we do for all of our piecing for our quilts. And you'll see that we press this open. In general, when I'm piecing a quilt, I like to piece, I'm sorry, I like to press to one side or the other because I find that that um, makes nesting two pieces together nicer for me. We can have a whole argument about this with people. There are definitely quilters who swear by always pressing open, totally allowed. There's no right or wrong way to do most things. There's just everybody's preference and stuff they've tried and, you know, landed on. Um, so why did we press this one open? In this case, pressing open means that your eventual multi-layered binding, right? Because we're doing double folded binding, just like this. It ends up being lots of layers, right? We're going to fold it in half, sew it together, fold it in half again. If you press to one side or the other, on the side that has all that seam allowance, you're getting double the edge, or sorry, the bulk. And then on the other side, you have none. So what you end up with is like kind of like a bump, like a lumpy section. So if you fold it open instead, that section becomes flatter once it's put together and it's kind of nicer. Well, small little detail makes your work look, it looks like you know what you're doing, right? So a uh, quarter inch seam pressed open, and then you'll see that we've marked the line. So if I'm doing um, straight grain binding, I don't mark my lines first. I just align my ruler and I slice with a rotary cutter, right? On bias binding, you do need to mark because it is very confusing and you need those guidelines before you go any further. So the big trick here is that these lines need to be parallel to the bias edge that you cut, right? Not parallel to the on the grain edge that you started with. I'm going to take my ruler again and I'm just going to demonstrate straight edge, bias edge, bias edge, bias line. I'm sorry, yeah, bias line, bias line, right? So we're doing two and a half inch binding here. Um, people have different opinions on how wide your binding should be. We tend to default to a two and a half inch width. Sometimes I do two and a quarter so that I can be, sorry, not two and a quarter, two and three eighths, so that I can be a little bit sloppier and end up with the width still looking pretty good on the back. But in general, two and a half is kind of standard. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna mark the lines parallel all the way across however many fit in the piece that you've made. And what you wanna look for to make sure that they're marked on the bias, because again, we're gonna be cutting, right? Every cut that we do needs to be on the bias and not on the grain. If I rotate this this way and I put my ruler parallel to the on the grain edge instead, one tip to see that you're not pointing in the right direction is that your ruler and your seam will actually be parallel to, I'm sorry, perpendicular to each other. You see that? If you see this, this is wrong. Don't do this. And you know why you don't do this? Because once you cut here, you're cutting back on the grain. And then you're making straight grain binding, but in a much more confusing way. So you are intending to cut on the bias, right? So your ruler has to be parallel to the bias edge that you cut. Clear as mud, hopefully? Yes. Did anyone ask any questions? I feel like this is the most confusing no part. No questions yet. We have okay. some comments, but... Um... All right, good. Then I'm gonna assume I was very clear and I'm gonna move on to the next step. So the next step is we're gonna make this very odd looking piece. Uh, to me, it kind of looks like some kind of animal, but I couldn't tell you what kind of animal. <laughs> um, but basically it is this piece that we've rolled and sewn together. And why did we do this? We did this in order to make that line that we drew 
continue unbroken all the way around the tube that we've sewn together. So can you see what I'm doing here? I'm tracing the blue line all the way around. So when we start cutting, we will be cutting a continuous cut all the way down, all the way to the other edge. And then we'll have one continuous piece of binding. Uh, this is super confusing if you're looking at it like this, but let me show you, it's not that confusing to actually do. So we're gonna go back to our piece that we had marked, right? With our lines that are parallel to the bias cut, bias line, bias line. I'm gonna flip this over and I'm just gonna roll. Now, if I sew this together, just like this, what am I making? I'm making a tube, right? That's not what I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make this weird floppy shape. How am I gonna do that? All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my two points and I'm gonna pull them away from each other. And can you see those parallel lines starting to line up? So instead of them being, whoops, I shouldn't have rotated because that makes me confused. So instead of them lining up to the same place, they're going to line up offset by one. So here we go. This edge now lines up with this first line and this line lines up with the second line. This line lines up with the edge. And this creates this funny shape. Once we have those aligned, I'm just gonna pin together the parts that actually overlap, like so. And I'm just gonna stitch with a quarter inch seam allowance, just this piece. I mean, I suppose you could sew all the way to here, but like there's nothing there, so there's no reason to. And once those two are stitched together with a quarter inch seam allowance, we end up with the funny shape that we were going for all along. And once we have this funny shape, we have that continuous blue line that we were aiming for, and we simply are going to cut. So um, when Andrea does this, she tends to do this actually with scissors like this. Um, I have a lot of trouble because of my hands when I use scissors. So I tend to cut with a rotary cutter. I just go real slow. But I'm demoing with the scissors just so you can see that even if you use a scissor, you're gonna keep going, right? I'm just gonna rotate a little bit and keep cutting. We do have a question from Alice Gurney. How would you go about using a one yard cut of fabric and not a small 12 inch square? That is a great question and I actually have a demo for that in just a minute. So stay tuned. Stay Alice. tuned, yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop cutting now just because you get the point, Which right? Which is a great question. Oh, it's a great question. Because I was, I was wondering the same thing, to be honest. So you see how I've cut past this seam? Um, don't pay attention to how badly I cut that. Um, so now I have the beginning of my bias strip, and I'm just gonna keep cutting until I've cut it all apart, and I will end up well, once I fold it in half and press it, I will end up with a barber pole. And because this print has this tiny stripe, look how cute this barber pole is. Like, I can't wait to use this for some project. So this is the basic concept. And the reason we started this demo by using a square piece of fabric is because the concept of doing this is so much easier to get through your head, what goes where, if you start with a square, because it is, uh, par uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Symmetrical, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and our brains just inherently understand symmetry better. So because these two triangles are exactly the same shape and size, when I do this, it's not that confusing, right? If I had started with a rectangular piece and try to explain this whole concept with a rectangle, it's so much easier to get lost. But hopefully this is pretty understandable, right? Now- and Most books and tutorials will show it with a square also. Yeah. It's not, not that you can't do it with a rectangle, but most, like if you were to look this up online or see it in a book, it's usually gonna be a square. Yeah, so it's funny because when we were talking about this tutorial, um, we didn't actually talk to each other about this particular detail. And Andrea assumed that we were gonna do a square. And I, I, it had to be a square. 
I assumed we were going to do a rectangle because I had never seen the square version before. <laughs> so I had weird. only ever seen the rectangle version wow, before. Um, and so we ended up having a very weird conversation yeah. where <laughs> we were talking sense. about the same thing, but also not talking about the same thing. And anyway, uh, here's the explanation for what to do when you have a rectangle. So because most of us are buying fabric off the bolt and it's 40 inches wide, but you're not necessarily going to want to buy a 40 inch long piece of fabric, right? To make a 40 inch square. If you're starting with a rectangle, whoops, this looks like a mess, but it is a rectangle, uh, a rectangle, I promise. If you're starting with a rectangle, you're actually going to follow the exact same instructions, except for the line that gets cut is not going through two corners. It's still a 45 degree angle, just like before. And basically you're going to pick one corner. You're going to put your ruler, your 45, well, I just lined that up badly. What am I trying to do? I always do this when I'm trying to think about how it looks on the camera yeah. because I'm so like... I laid it on the cutting mat. <laughs> yeah, on the cutting mat it's a little bit easier, I, I think. just put the corner where the 45 degrees on the mat is. So anyway, the way you use these marks on a ruler, the 45 degree marks on a ruler, is that you line up the mark, um, although now that I think about it, well, whatever. This is the basic point. You mark, you mind, mm, line up the one line, 45 degree line, right? So 45 degree line goes here, and I'm going to cut from one corner into wherever it lands at a 45 degree angle, okay? So this half looks exactly like this, right? I mean, these squares aren't the same size, but this is the same right angle, uh, what? Yeah, but there's a word for this kind of triangle. Right triangle. Right triangle, there you go. Same right triangle that we already had before. This part, totally understandable, right? This part, super weird. Uh, rhombus or whatever word this is. So. Pretend we know geometry. Yeah, I didn't do so good at that. Um, and we're gonna do the same thing we did before. But before we had an option. We could put the triangle on one side or we could put it on the other side. When you have a rectangle, you don't have a choice. You have to put it on this side. Why? Because it doesn't fit on the other side. Like that would look ridiculous, right? So you put it right here. The beauty of the way we cut it is look, the stripes look really good. This shape, this parallelogram shape, is exactly the same as the parallelogram that we had a minute ago when we used the square. The only difference is that the dimensions of the different sides are slightly off, right? Before, this edge and this edge were the same. Now, this edge and this edge are different lengths, but the shape, the parallelogram shape, is exactly the same. We got two parallel diagonal bias cuts and two parallel straight cut on the grain. And all the other steps are exactly the same. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Who, what was the name of the I person? Hope so it was Alice. Alice. Did that help, I mean, Alice? It helped me understand. <laughs> yeah, we had a very funny conversation yeah, before we went on this video. Uh, Lisa Curley says, this is so cool. I finally understand how this works. Hey. I've seen the explanation of books, but now it makes sense. This is our goal. We like to simplify. This is something that's hard to read in a book. Though. Oh, yeah. and. Because how do you draw that? Like, right. It's, it's not easy to draw. <laughs> right. And like step throughs, the, the, the word strep through means like we made steps. Yes, Alice says. Thank right. You. So that we could demonstrate without actually having to cut and mark and all that kind of stuff. When you look at um, still tutorials on the internet, you're really just seeing the step throughs and not the glue between each step. Mm -hmm. So it really helps to have a, a video where someone's actually yeah. doing it. So this little animal right here is the progress mm -hmm. when I went to cut my bias out. And then you just keep going until you're done. And then you would just want to press that last seam. You could press it before you cut it, but sometimes it's too It's kind of hard, yeah, yeah. So because it's, it it's not that flat. You just don't want to forget to press it, that's all. Yeah, well, you'll learn, you'll remember to press it as soon as you start to sew it together, because it's going to be, it in half, yep, you'll figure it out. Yep. Um, yeah, so that is the end of this uh, 
quick and dirty how you make bias binding. Ask us any questions if you can think of them while I play with my samples. You might be wondering how you know what size square or rectangle to cut. Or how much it makes. Right. Or, yep. Yes, exactly. So we're actually going to link to two um, online calculators that we found online for how much continuous inches you can make given a certain amount of fabric. Right, in, in various um, strip widths as well. That's a good point because so if you, cuts yep. two and a half. if you're cutting a cut a narrower binding, you need less fabric, of course, right? Yeah, and it's even for even smaller widths, like an inch and a half in case you are doing it for garments or yep. various other things. Although personally, I don't think I would bother. I would just buy pre-made binding can. if it was very well, narrow. Well, same reason here, if you want right. a striped, a striped binding on a garment could... Oh, I mean, that cameras. would be very cute. <laughs> would, yes, exactly. It would so be cute. Like me, I just very stripey. Yeah, you do like a lot of stripes. Is my binding here? No, it's not. I'm actually wearing a striped t-shirt, but it doesn't have binding, so. So anyway, that is the end of our very simple, hopefully very approachable bias binding tutorial. Uh, leave us comments or send us emails if you have any questions. If you have a technique that you want us to break down in a future video, we would love to hear from you. Also just some housekeeping. Um, our My NYC fabric has not arrived yet, but we are hoping to get a shipment notification any minute now. So as soon as it comes, believe me, we will yell it from the rooftops and tell you that it's here. Um, we are still taking pre-orders. We have not sold out of our initial print run. So go ahead and put orders into the website and you'll get the first dibs on that, those first few bolts that come off the printing lines. Um, the other update is that next week we will be, Andrea and I are both going to BU, which is Bernina University, the annual conference that Bernina does. This year they're back to in person, unfortunately. So we have to go in person. I really wish it was virtual again because I am not looking forward to getting on a plane right now. But we will be going, which means that we almost certainly won't be live tomorrow, not tomorrow, next week on Tuesday. Um, once we get there and we see like roughly how things go, we might end up being able to pull it off. Yeah, we might do just a few minutes because the product launch, they do the product launch on Tuesday morning. Right. And if it's that, if it's exciting enough, we might just have to come tell you about it. Yeah. So there might be a surprise live, um, unscheduled live, but yeah. So anyway, next week is a weird week. Um, and it's because Andrea and I are going to be a BU. And related to that, the store is going to be closed on Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Um, so that's the 12th and the 13th. And um, it's just staffing is the reason. Um, so plan around that. We're still taking orders online and we're, we'll still be shipping on those days. We just won't be open for in-store shopping. Um, is there any other housekeeping I needed to Not cover? That I can think of. Okay, then uh, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us. We love seeing you every week and we hope to see you in the next one. Have a good night. Bye.